I lie back in a hammock, rays of sun reaching me through the spaces between leaves far above. Everything feels calm and connected. I am at peace, blissfully alone, yet connected. I don't pronounce a consonant and instead take a breath, staggering my breathing with others on a long phrase in a choral piece. And in this moment, I hear and feel the miracle of deep connection, of harmony, of lots of hard individual and communal work paying off, creating a moment of beauty and transcendence, creating a moment where we can be fully in and present and hovering above what is occurring. I find myself in despair. All I felt I'd known was true. All I'd built my life upon, gone. And I find myself in a deep, narrow tunnel that no is just a hole. Yet at the bottom, though it is cold and dark, I sense somehow beauty. I feel and know a presence of love and rest assured that I am not alone, that even here there is something with me. Three very different but distinct moments where I felt so clearly in relationship with and aware of my own understanding of the ultimate the intimate, the higher power, deeper power, spirit of life that some of us know as God, and some of us know as truth, and some of us know as another name or no name at all. Now, why do I say higher power, deeper power, ultimate, intimate? Very briefly, I once had a congregant in the very first congregation I served that was a part of an AA group and told me that he had struggled with this concept of higher power, right? But he was committed to working the program, but he was like, I'm a Unitarian Universalist, I'm anti-authoritarian, higher power does not work for me, right? But deeper power, something within and beneath and connected to him as if a root of a tree that he could get down with. So we use the words higher, but also deeper, right? Below and within, as well as ultimate and intimate. For we believe that what is above, literally, not necessarily an authority, but what hovers above us is also what lies within and beneath us, right? What is between and below us. Got it. Great. Now, from my snippets, you can likely gather that for me, an important characteristic of this higher, deeper power, ultimate, intimate is connectedness. Right? Makes sense based on the stories I shared. A ray of sunshine, feeling connected, even though I was alone for one moment as a mom of a toddler. That happens rarely. Right? Singing in a choir, feeling deeply connected to others in melody and harmony, and even in the depths of despair, realizing that I am not alone, that there is a love even there that holds me. Now, this connectedness is a characteristic, a description of how I understand deeper power. We all have different characteristics and different vital characteristics of what we conceptualize as ultimate. And what these are, we'll discuss today, are actually more important than what names we use. So the characteristics, the nature, whatever the nature of our truth is, 
affects how we live much more than when we call this God, goddess, spirit, truth, or reason, right? The characteristic of that ultimate truth for us is much more important than the word we might use to talk about it, whether it's truth or God's. Now, to step back and get heady for a moment, I think it'll, it'll help things make sense in the end. We're going to talk about some different schools of theology. So entire schools of theology were created based off what academics would call divine properties in systematic theology. The two most popularly heard are, one, what academics would call first cause theology, what most of us would know as creator God, right? Second, what academics would call perfect being theology, and most of us have heard maybe God being talked about in words like omniscient or omnipotent, all-knowing and all-powerful, perfect generally. Now, these are perhaps two of the most talked about ways of talking about a God, and quite frankly, I think they're not the best ways, and a whole lot of very smart theologians beginning in the 20th century happen to agree with me which is where I learned it from. So, ultimacy, in their opinion, is the most fruitful divine property to use. Now, ultimacy here means ultimate reality. So whatever our understanding of what ultimate reality is, is what matters most, is our God, our truth, our reason. Okay, one more time. Ultimacy means ultimate reality. So whatever our understanding of the ultimate reality is, is what matters most. Is our God, our truth, our reason. Yeah, now we're there. So for some of us, the ultimate reality might consist of a God or goddesses, and for others, it will not. But what the ultimate reality is, the particular characteristics, the purpose and meaning of this ultimate reality, that is what matters most, no matter what word we use to describe this ultimate. Now, the beauty here is that ultimacy really applies to theists, atheists, agnostics, pantheists, panentheists, everyone. What matters most is what is most important to us, our ultimate reality the why of why we're here, the what of what's going on. We say that for Unitarian Universalists, it matters less what you believe and more how you live, right? Now it's true and it's more complicated than that because what we believe should and does affect how we live, right? What doesn't matter is if we put those beliefs in theist, pantheist, or atheist categories. If we believe that love is ultimate, love is ultimate. If we believe that hope is ultimate, hope is ultimate. If we believe that goodness or beauty or joy are ultimate, then those are ultimate. The list goes on. And we know that what we believe is often more complex than the one word characteristics I can put in a sermon that won't have you sitting here all day, right? Your ultimate reality might not be able to be characterized in one word, and that is good and fine. So what is ultimate for us is ultimate for us, whatever labels we put on it, be they God or truth. Now. We might still be a little confused, so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get there. And we're going to explain a little more what this concept of ultimacy means by turning to Reverend Dr. Paul Tillich, who some of you have heard me quote before. Now, he is one of the theologians who really pioneers and builds this concept of ultimacy. So Paul Tillich was a renowned theologian, a white man born in 1886 in what was at the time Germany, though is now Poland. His father was a Lutheran pastor and his family moved to Berlin in 1900 due to a call his father received for a new position. At the age of 25, he graduated with a doctoral degree in philosophy and a year later he was ordained as a minister in the Lutheran church. 
He then spent two decades working for and lecturing at universities, speaking on philosophy and theology. Now, he also walked his talk and preached and What's the, what, there's a phrase I'm looking for, and it's gone for me now. He walked his talk. He practiced what he preached. There we go. And in 1933, Tillich was dismissed from his post due to his general li liberalism, but most specifically his opposition to the Nazi movement and his belief that all people deserve safety and life. And so he comes to America and winds up working at Union Theological Seminary in New York City which was and still is a pillar of religious liberalism in the United States. Now, Paul Tillich, who studied philosophy, that's what his doctor was in, was influenced deeply by existentialism and, of course, his opposition to some of the political movements of his time. Now, how can Tillich help us understand this concept of ultimacy? Tillich talks about ultimacy using terms such as ultimate concern, or what we care most about, as well as ground of being and meaning. So that the thing we care about, the ultimate meaning of reality for us, forms the foundation of our lives. A quick pause to say it's lovely that this month our theme is our foundation, our foundation of UU theological beliefs. Okay. Okay, so back to Tillich. Our ultimate concerns are the things we care the most about. Our ultimate concerns are the things we care the most about, and they are symbols and guides towards our concept of ultimate reality. Here's an example. If my ultimate reality, hypothetically speaking, is one of connection, the things I am most concerned about are all of the barriers that create disconnection. I care about people being able to communicate with one another, having both the spaces and the skills to do this. I care about the socially created barriers that keep us from one another, like poverty and racism and all oppression, because I believe that I am broken and not fully whole until I can be truly connected with all. My ultimate concerns these things that bother me the most point the way to my ultimate reality. Make sense? It's actually a lovely ringtone. Okay, my ultimate concerns, my ultimate concerns, the things that concern me the most, that I am most passionate and energized by, based on the imperfection of the world, point the way towards my ultimate reality. I am upset when I see disconnection, when I see ties severed, and that helps me to know that the thing I care the most about and the answer to the problems I see is connection, right? Okay. Someone telling me that they believe in God or goddess or reason or truth doesn't actually tell me much about what someone believes in, right? Someone telling me what they are more, most concerned about in our reality and what they believe the answer to these concerns is tells me a whole lot about what someone believes and who they are. Someone telling me the reality of the world that they long for tells me a whole lot about what they believe and who they are. Someone telling me the reason, the ultimate reality of why they believe we're here and what it is we are called to do, this is far more important than any label we might put on an ultimate, intimate, higher power, deeper power. So, a moment for some reflection. What are your ultimate concerns? And what ultimate reality do they point towards? Or, if that question doesn't roll for you, what is your ultimate reality? And are your current concerns aligned with this? Or have they perhaps gotten a bit off track as happens in life? 
Take a moment to reflect on your ultimate concerns and ultimate reality. All right. If you are reflecting and realizing that the ultimate reality that you've known for a long time no longer feels deeply present in your life, know that you are not alone and you are normal. What Tillich would say about this is that we not only have the capacity to understand reality, but also to shape it. And so our actions shape our reality. Sometimes this is amazing, right? And sometimes we might think, huh, perhaps my actions are creating a reality I'm not particularly wanting. I'll share myself that though my main concerns feel pretty on track with my ultimate reality of connection, my relationship with my ultimate reality is in need of some love, particularly at this point in my tired parent of a now toddler state. Better than when, you know, she was a baby, but it's, it's exhausting. Now, for someone whose ultimate reality is all about connection, I spend a lot of time disconnecting and numbing my mind with the scroll. Some of you know the scroll. After my responsibilities of the day are done. So I find myself today asking, how might I kind of zone out and recharge in a way that is more aligned for me and what I believe? Right? How can I be creating time of connection that is fueling me and my life, fueling my relationship to what is ultimate for me, and not just kind of zoning out of the whole, the whole reality? It's fine to do for a little bit, but I, I got some work to do, folks, so I'm just letting you know. So I ask, how might we all bring our lives more in alignment with our conception of what is ultimate? Are you taking the time to be in relationship with whatever is ultimate for you? If not, or if you're like, I could also be doing a little better, how might you do this? And what practices might you start? Now remember that simple, easy, daily practices are the way to go for relationship building whether with other humans or ultimate reality, right? I thought that was a little fun. Okay. So take a moment to think about how might you foster this relationship with whatever you consider to be ultimate? What practices might you start to just create a connection and check in? Be present with this ultimate reality. And then we might wonder, how is our ultimate reality, belief, value aligning with our current lives, with our time and how we spend it? Are there shifts that we long to make so more of our active time can be in pursuit of addressing our ultimate concerns and our ultimate reality? Just one more moment of reflection. Thank you for considering and taking the time for these questions. It's my hope that we may know our ultimate reality and grow in relationship with it. May we make it become real together through the addressing of our concerns and may we do this together joyously, knowing that we will experience deep connection between our ultimate concerns and realities and between each other delving into both beautiful learning and action together. Amen. May it be so, and may we make it so.